just having some camera trouble. I think it's fixed now. Right, I'm doing a video um, for my colour chemistry series today, which features red watercolours. I'm a bit late. I wanted to get this uploaded ready for World AIDS Day, which was the 1st of December. But what I've decided to do is upload it late. And what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to monitor my YouTube profits that come from this particular video for the next 12 months and on World AIDS Day 2017, so 1st of December 2017, I will take every penny that has come in through this video, which I will demonstrate to you all by giving you a screenshot of the income report for the whole year, and I will donate that amount to World AIDS Day and I will double it. So I will double it from my own pocket uh, because it's such an important charity and I don't care how old you are, I don't care whether you're married, I don't care whether you are single, gay, straight, transgendered, bisexual, asexual, doesn't matter. If you're sexually active at all, you need four STI tests a year. End of story. Doesn't matter whether you're in a monogamous relationship, because you don't know for absolute certain whether your other half has cheated on you at any point. And a good way to find out is when you find out you've got an STI. So it is important, and given most new cases of HIV and similar diseases are actually being found amongst married couples where exactly that has happened, it is really important to get yourselves tested. And there is no excuse for not doing it in 2016 going into 2017. So please, for goodness sakes, get bloody tested and let's get some of these diseases out of circulation. Smallpox we got rid of by vaccinating. It is now eradicated in the wild. There is no reason why STIs shouldn't be in the same place. We can get rid of them by testing, making sure they're treated and making sure they're not being transmitted. So for please, for God's sake, also use a condom. The, re the regulatory thing at the moment that's coming from the HIV charities is until you have been in a monogamous relationship for 12 months and had four consecutively clear STI tests you still need to use barrier contraception. That terrifies a lot of people when I tell them that, because they think, oh, that doesn't apply to me, you know. Oh, well, no, he's not the sort of person who'd have HIV, so that's fine. Those are the sort of people that catch it. It's that attitude. Anyway, on to the craft and the art. Now, um, I'm going through red watercolours today, but I just wanted to show you a couple of things that I've managed to um, procure today. Um, I got this... It looks really milky, but it's not. It's just because it's rolled up. This is a roll, um, an imperial sheet size roll, or is it? No, it's not. It's a 50 centimeter by 60 centimeter roll of 0.35 millimeter thick. Um, what is sold as um, clear glass polypropylene. So perfect for the front of shaker cards, I thought, because it's a bit thicker than acetate and very robust. So I got that. I also got some card bases which are black with black envelopes because I'm doing some black shaker cards for Christmas for some uh, videos that are coming up and these are A6 um, cards with C6 envelopes. That's A6 as in the European A6 meaning half of A5. Um, so I couldn't honestly tell you what they are in um, oh, what the hell, let's measure it. They, let's do it in American measurements. Four inches by about, they're about four by six, roughly. We would call that A6 in the UK. So I have those, and I also picked up a scrap pack of um, bits of paper. If you make cards or scrapbook or anything else, these things are brilliant because you get all sorts of different papers in there, little bits of them, little strips, little pieces. Enough to make an embellishment or a trim or, you know, these pieces are big enough to make a card front with. And that whole pack, which is probably about 50 pieces, 60 pieces, maybe even 100 pieces, was £1.65. So about $2. Brilliant value. And again, you'll see those in my Christmas cards, which are coming up really soon. So I'm working today on Aquafine Smooth, which is Dana and Rowney's student line watercolour paper. And Aquafine Smooth is the hot press. So it's a £140 hot press paper. And the first sheet of it, I'm working on the back of another project. I'm only using hot press today just because, well, it was on my table. So I grabbed it. And I'm going to go through all the red watercolours that I have um, red for World AIDS Day. This kind of follows on from the yellows that I've done in my colour chemistry series. I was going to do the blues, actually, but I thought it was World AIDS Day. I'll do the reds. 
So um, I've got them all pre-sprayed and pre-wetted. So I'm going to write down what they are um, as we go. And I will do that using something that I can um, paint over if need be. So I'm using a Pigma um, pen. I will draw some black lines on here so that I can show opacity as well. Because that's always important. And this is not going to be beautiful, neat and tidy because I can't really be bothered. And I'm not going to mix them by um, family of reds or anything like that. This is the order they're in in my palettes. And I don't... I don't put anything in my palettes in any kind of like proper order. I just literally put things in in the order that suits me because it's for me. And what I actually do is they're actually just thrown in in the order I buy them. And um, and I kind of leave it at that. And what I'll do in this video is I'll talk you through all these reds, the minerals and the dyes, how they all work. And I will also um, show you how they mix. I'll mix some of them, not all of them. Mix some of them with greens and um, to make neutrals, and we'll see how that goes. Now these are all Windsor and Newton professional um, watercolors. Now some of them, I will warn you, are discontinued. Some of them like the one that I'm writing now, 006, bright red. They haven't made that for over 10 years, but I happen to have some. There are others that um, some people might include, things like light red. Um, it, I will include, but I won't be including burnt sienna. It, arguably, it's more of a red, but I'm kind of going for anything that's got red in the name and anything that is red, um, you know, proper, proper red. Um, as the Australians would say, close your ears, sensitive people. Balls out, red, as the um, as the Australian viewers would say. Now I'm just writing them all on here. Yes, I could have done this in advance, but I wanted to tell you a little bit of um, why these particular colours, why I have so many. One. This is a job, so don't think, oh, he's got all these colours, so-and-so I watch on YouTube has all these colours, I need all of them as well. I didn't go out and buy a hundred watercolours. They've kind of come to me over a long time. Um, they, they've, been, they've built up over many years, and... That's why I have got quite a large number. You can skip through this part if you want to. I have absolutely no issue with you doing that. I'm not writing pigment information on here. But I will talk a little bit, not an awful lot, but a little bit about the pigments that are used in some of these paints as I go. I have sprayed all my paints well in advance, so they should be wet when we come to use them. Because I do think that they often need it really um, I find with watercolour sometimes some colours lift lift from a, a dried you know where you poured it yourself some lift more easily than others um and it, that is a tricky one. Some colours just don't want to lift. And the one that I'm thinking of right now is this one, Potter's Pink. Cute colour. But it doesn't want to come back up quite as easily. Um, as... Uh, 
as others do, and that is really, really, really annoying. I put Peril in Violet on there. And then I realised to myself, I don't think it even is Peril in Violet. Um, oh, it is Peril in Violet, 470. That's right. Um, it's kind of red, so, you know, I thought I'd include it. Seemed the best thing to do. And I'm working today with a Daylon D77 synthetic size 12 round. It's kind of my go-to brush, I suppose. And I'm just going to put in some lines of black Pro Marker just so that we've got something for opacity um, checking. So just a black alcohol marker. If you want to do the same kind of thing, you can use Pro Marker, Copic, Sharpie. Honestly, doesn't matter. Quality doesn't matter. Just as long as it's waterproof and really black. I have seen some people like Mandy Van Hoya use um, Indian ink to create the same kind of black that you could then paint over. I don't like it because I think it adds a layer on. It adds a, a layer of pigment on top of the paper, so you're not going to see how the paint would appear on black paper. You're seeing how it would appear over black pigment. Whereas with a dye-based marker like this, it'll soak in and. Um, you'll get kind of an effective look to it. So, uh, you know, it won't look too artificial. So I'm going to go in with my first colour, which is on the top left, and that is good old cadmium red, which is a mineral pigment. It is very opaque. It's one of the colours that actually many people start out with when they paint, because if you're painting acrylic or you're painting um, oil, the cadmium reds are really important and they're really important in watercolour as well however they're not necessarily the best reds to be using because they're very opaque and very granular and that might not be the look you're after but they're a warm red and they're like the, the warm red everyone knows every painter knows cad red as warm red i'm using alizarin crimson now now this is the original alizarin crimson it's not permanent alizarin crimson reason is that I don't actually like this colour very much, so I don't use it, so I've never bothered to get the permanent version. I only really have it for um, mixing purposes. It's just, I don't like the alizarin, the cool red alizarin crimsons. I use a different cool red um, in my split palette, just how I am. Next one is permanent rose, which is actually quinacridone rose, but Winsor & Newton call it permanent rose. That is what I tend to use as my cool red. So I'm going to try and get these on as quick as I can and then we'll go we'll get closer looking and we'll have a go through their properties. Next up is Opera Rose and I have got a whole video dedicated to Opera Rose in the color chemistry series and I will put that in the i cards so that you can see it. Putting on some others now that are probably going to appear perhaps a little bit off the camera. So let's push this up. Yeah, I think I can just about fit these on. This is Rose Madder. Again, original Rose Madder, not permanent Rose Madder. I like Rose Madder as a colour, and I don't find it fades that much. Um, certainly, I can, leave, I can leave it in the palette for years and never see any difference in the colour. I've got paintings in my studio that I've done just like... Um, all sanguine paintings that I've done entirely in red um, using that because it's a colour I love and nothing happens. Um, but then they're not in bright sunlight. And then Indian red, which is a iron oxide mineral pigment. It's not really a red particularly. It's a brown, I suppose. But it's got red in the name, so it's going on here today. Now brown madder, which is actually quinacridone burnt scarlet. So... I see that as a red, but it's really an orange. Um, it's a lovely colour. It's one of those colours I don't use much. It's nice when you want a brown that's transparent. 
It's really useful if you want a transparent brown, if you want to keep a painting with just transparent colours, that's a useful one. And now bright red, which is a discontinued. The reason they discontinued it is you could just mix it, I think, with pyrrole red and white. Um, and I think maybe it's got a bit of yellow in it as well. But I got hold of it in a clearance section in my local art store, which is the art side in Plymouth. And um, they always have discontinued crap. I don't know where the hell they get it from, but they always seem to have it. And light red, which is another of the mineral pigments. It's lighter than Indian red, but it's still a sludgy brown. It always looks a bit like dried blood to me. Um, probably shows a lot about how my mind works, I guess. But it's again a useful one, but I think if you want to keep things clear, Brown Madder or Van Dyke Brown can be really useful to have. Right. Just have to swap palettes over. The next one is a colour called Sanguine Red which is 165. I've written it as 115 because I can't read my own handwriting. There we go. And Sanguine Red is um, a limited edition colour, so they may not still have that available. It was in one of their limited edition sets that they did. Um, it's a really nice colour. It uses a really obscure pink pigment that I really like, but um, isn't the easiest thing to get hold of. Perilyn Maroon is one of those really bloody colours. Um, again, it's a lovely one if you want an intense dye-based colour that keeps transparent, and it looks very much like blood. There is a painter on the Windsor & Newton website who uses this to do paintings that are done as though they are like you know, he just murdered someone and painted with their blood. That's how that's his style of painting, and he uses that to do it. Venetian red is another of the mineral oxides. Um, it's really darker than Indian red. Sorry, it's more opaque than Indian red and light red, but it's more similar to light red in hue, I suppose. Um, it's more orangey than Indian red, which is really a brown, but it's a useful old colour to have. Permanent Carmine, again, it's one of those ones that I like in theory, but I can't really find anything to do with it. It's very, very vivid, and it's got a very unusual pigment again. Now, there are two Windsor Reds, and they are basically Pyrrole Red and Pyrrole Red Deep. This one's Windsor Red Deep, so Pyrrole Red Deep. Good if you want a fairly neutral red which is a useful thing to have. I think neutral reds are great. Cadmium Scarlet, very, very, very warm, very orangey, very opaque, very granular. And now Scarlet Lake coming up. Doing pretty well at keeping my water clean. It's amazing. Again, very granular, very opaque, and with it being scarlet, very warm. Not as yellow as cadmium scarlet, but pretty good all the same. I know Rosa Dore, which is a literally um, pink with gold, or golden pink. Um, it's a yellow, a very yellow um, pink. Quite a pale colour, probably very useful in botanical paintings, but too weak to do anything else with, really. Now I'll just swap my palettes over again. Quinacridone Red, I'm going to have to apologise, this may... It's a bit far away from the camera there. This may come out a little bit brown. Um, there's some contamination on the top of it with green. Oh no, we're alright, the Quinacridone Red has worked. Now, in terms of pigment, there are several pigments called quinacridone red. So, just because a paint is called quinacridone red, check it has the pigment you want. There are several different PRs, which are called quinacridone red, and several different PVs, which are called quinacridone red. Be careful. Caput Mortuum, literally the death's head, supposedly because the original Caput Mortuum years ago 
did look a lot like blood. It's much darker these days. It's much more of a sort of uh, almost a purplish brown, extremely granulating and extremely beautiful. Um, if you want to paint en brunei in brown with no other colours, that's a great colour to do it with. And if you mix it with any of the quinacridone magentas, you can kind of bring it to life a little bit. So now Windsor Red, which is the pyrrole red that's not deep, the non-deep pyrrole red, which has got a lovely brightness to it that you don't get in the pyrrole red. Again, dye-based, not particularly opaque, very pretty, very neutral. Pyrrole Red Deep is perhaps a little cooler. This one's perhaps a little warmer, but they're both really neutral reds. Potter's Pink, Bane of My Life, because I can't work out what to do with it. It's a nice colour, but in watercolour, I can't find a use for it. It's just so insipid. And it has a really annoying property that if you mix anything with it, you know, you mix that with a yellow, it will granulate out of the mix. So you'll end up with a puddle of yellow with pink blobs inside it. And it won't stay mixed because it's so hydrophobic. It's a silicate and it does not want to stay in water. So it's great for acrylic, it's great for oil, but it's crap for watercolour. Permanent magenta is one of several magentas that I'm going to show off today. Not really red, one could argue they're really purples and they're dyes, but they're wonderfully vivid and they can make a nice change if you want a cool red that's really cool. Instead of permanent rose, you could use these. So these could be useful colours for you. Yeah, we're only 20 minutes in and I did a 10 minute kind of preamble, I guess. Quinacridone magenta is another similar magenta. I think permanent magenta is another quinacridone red, actually. And this one is a different quinacridone. So you get all sorts of different variations on quite a subtle theme. And I'll do my last colour for you. Then we'll go through some of these, talk about them and maybe do some mixing. And this is Perilyn Violet, which of course is much more violet than Perilyn Maroon, which was almost bloody. This one is, well, it's still kind of bloody, but it's more purple. And again, it's dye-based, so if you want that wonderful coolness there, that could be another option for dye-based painting. I did speak to a, a viewer the other day who was asking me about how to set up a, um, a, 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 a limited palette of six colours with split primaries entirely dye-based. Now, I don't recommend doing that because your paintings are going to look so flat and so boring. Even if you use the roughest paper on earth, if you only use dye-based colours, you will have really flat paintings because you need a bit of mineral sometimes to just give it a bit of texture and a bit of depth. And it's really hard to achieve depth if you only use dyes, just saying. So there's all the reds that I have. Um, and I have quite a lot of reds, quite a lot more than many people really need. So let's have a closer look. Let's get this in focus, first of all. So cadmium red, you can see, probably see, it covers up the black. It is semi-opaque. Alizarin crimson, dye-based, doesn't do that. Permanent Rose there, really beautiful colour and it's got a lot of depth to it that the camera doesn't really show. Opera Rose, beautiful, beautiful pink. Um, it is incredibly fugitive, unfortunately. It actually fades to something similar to Permanent Rose, so you might want to just use diluted Permanent Rose instead if you want permanency. Rose Madder, again, fugitive, but I don't think it's that bad, you know. I wouldn't use it for something I was going to sell, but it's fine for other things. It's a nice colour. Indian red, almost brownish when it dries, but it has got a redness to it. Quinacridone burnt scarlet brown madder is a wonderful dye-based, non-granulating, lovely, um, kind of dirty orange, I suppose. It's the best way to describe it. Bright red. Here is a lovely warm opaque red, but it's got a lot of yellow in it, so you can mix that yourself if you can't get hold of it anymore. Light red is this sort of slightly more insipid version of Indian red. 
Sanguine red. I don't know why they called it that because it's really pink and it uses a dye. The, the dye that it's manufactured with is a pink dye, not a red dye. But it's a gorgeous, gorgeous colour. Not at all sanguine like. Perilin maroon. Now that is a bloody colour. Isn't that just the most wonderful colour? And then Venetian red, which is this much more orangey, very, very opaque, very granular colour. It's a bit too much in many ways. Um, be very careful when you mix with it. Now we have Windsor Red. Um, oh no, we don't. I'm lying. We have Permanent Carmine here, which is another one of those wonderful sort of pinky reds. Windsor Red Deep, which is looking a bit insipid, I have to say, here. Dye based again and entirely um, neutral. Cad Scarlet, very, very warm, very opaque. Scarlet Lake, extremely opaque, extremely granulating, and nice and warm as well. Rosa Dore, very warm, dye-based, quite subtle. Quinacridone Red, quite a basic red. Um, cooler than neutral, but not too cool. I quite like it. Caput Mortuum, almost a violet kind of colour it's a it's a very 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 granulating colour and that's what makes it so wonderful it's great for painting rocks with um good alternatives to some of the other iron pigments windsor red that's not deep neutral very straightforward potter's pink look how granular that is i mean it just flocculates like crazy very opaque permanent magenta really deep wonderful mysterious magenta I think quinacridone magenta is more like a cerise, very garish. And then perylene violet is nice. If you want to have a look at perylene violet against caput mortuum, they've got a tonality that's very similar, but obviously this is dye-based and very different. So that's all of the reds, and you can see that there is a lot of variety there. But if we want to make neutrals, we have to mix reds with greens. And that's not necessarily the easiest thing in the world. So what I thought I'd show you, controversial here, is some mixes one can make using a horrible green. This is really for Lindsay the Frugal Crafter. Lindsay hates oxide of chromium green, that horrible flat baby's nappy green, this one. Because it's so opaque, it always looks very flat. So what I thought I'd do is show you some options where you can mix interesting neutrals using that and some different reds. So first of all, let's um, let's try quinacridone red first of all, which is dye-based, very straightforward red, and we'll just mix them together. We'll just get a neutral to form. I'm wary because the oxide of chromium can be very overpowering. So I'm kind of adding it a little bit at a time. Seems to be okay. The first thing it does is it kind of makes this actually just a much duller red. It just dulls it down and you get some useful mixes that way. There we go. That's heading towards a neutral now. It's got, actually got too much red in it, would you believe? I thought it was going to have too much green, but no, too much red. And you can just keep adding more. But what you get, if I spread this out, I haven't taken it all the way to neutrality. But if I spread that out, look at the granulation in that. It's amazing. So you can use it to get lovely granular neutrals if you're struggling to get a neutral that's really granular. That's a way to do it. And it isn't too difficult to use it in that sense. You can also use it with um, dye-based with, sorry, with mineral-based reds, and I'm going to try doing a neutral with one I haven't used. I'm going to try Scarlet Lake, which I have to admit, I haven't done a lot of mixing with, but it's very granular. Now, there is a chance, with these both being very hydrophobic pigments, that these... I've just picked up Cadmium Scarlet by mistake, which I'm going to smush back into my palette so I don't waste it. I always do that. If I've picked up the wrong thing, if my brush is clean, I do put it back. It's easy to do on this palette. 
Um, let's take some Scarlet Lake. There is a chance that these two being very hydrophobic, they may both come out of solution and we may end up with red and green blobs or green blobs in a field of red. We may not be able to actually get a neutral. So part of the way there, we've ended up with quite an interesting dark granular red, but we haven't actually got enough green yet to give us our neutral. So let me get some more green. There we go, starting to neutralise now. And I'll spread that out over a large area. It's made of brown rather than a black because of the colour bias of the two components we've used to make it. I'll bring that up so that you can have a proper look at it in a moment. And it is granulating amazingly, I have to say. Both of them have, actually. They both flocculated really well. And the one on the left has done exactly what I worried about, which is the green coming out. So the green is actually granulated out of the mixture, which I think this one will do in time. Which is annoying as hell if you don't want that to happen. But it can be exactly what you want at other times. I'm going to put down some phthalo green yellow shade, which is a really intense dye based green. So that's got a yellow bias. If we want to get a good neutral, we're going to have to add a red that's got the correct bias as well. So if you think about the colour wheel, a very yellow green is closest to yellow which is closest to the very warm reds. So I'm going to need a very, very warm red to mix with this. And I'm going to go with... Uh, Cad Scarlet, which is obviously mineral-based. Because my rationale... I'm going to have to put some more green into this, I already know that. My rationale is when you mix a dye and a mineral together, you can get these interesting granulations. So I thought that would be an interesting way to do it. Let's just throw in some more green. I was very sparing with the green because the thalocyanine colours are so intense. I thought if I add too much, it's all going to go horribly wrong. But actually, I could have thrown in loads more. Not perfectly neutralised because there's a lot of green on my brush still. But we'll just leave that for a moment. Don't know if you can see it on the top right. But the colours have separated. Oxide of chromium likes to come out of solution. So let's have a look at what we've got. So that top left one was oxide of chromium with a... Um, Forgotten what I even used now. Memory is gone. I think it's one of the quinacridone reds, if I remember. But you can see the granulation is wonderful, and the green has actually come out of solution in the central area. This one that was perfectly neutral just now, the green has come away from the red, so we've got some interest. That could be really interesting if you were trying to do like a, a wall with moss on it or something. You could get the red of the brick with this green kind of patina over the top. And then this one here, where we used um, a phthalo dye with a granulating warm red. Again, we're getting heavy granulation, but it'll be interesting to see if we get red dots on a green field in a few minutes when that's had a chance to react. So some of the problems when you try to mix a neutral are not just getting the tone right, but sometimes getting a stable neutral that isn't just going to kind of come out of solution and surprise you later by not remaining neutral can be really annoying. Which is why we use the old faithful burnt sienna French ultramarine, because we know it will behave itself. So when you're picking your colours for a painting, it's really important to swatch them out. Swatch out all the mixes, including the neutral. So whether you're going to do, you know, if you've got a yellow, a blue and a, and a red that you're going to paint with, whether you're going to do 
complements and mix them or whether you're going to mix all the three colors together and that's going to be your neutral however you're going to do it make sure you do it and you leave them to dry and you come back and you make sure this hasn't happened and that you've got a stable neutral because if you haven't got a stable neutral all your shadows are going to look really odd now fine if that's what you want if you want this effect which i sometimes do that's absolutely fine but if I didn't want that to happen, if I didn't want the red to be coming out of the green there, that would be disastrous for my painting. And you don't want to find that out when you've started painting it. So there's a word of warning. Happens when you mix dye with mineral, usually. If I mix mineral with mineral, it can be a bit better as long as they both are okay with water. If they're very hydrophobic, very granulating, both of them, you will get problems. Now, if you do French Ultramarine Burnt Sienna, they've got similar affinities to water, so they will, sorry, they've got similar affinities to water to one another. So they both are okay with water. They both granulate, but they do it in a way that is kind of complementary and it looks all right. But what you don't want is, is that kind of thing to happen. So always make sure that you test your neutrals and you dry them down thoroughly before you um, examine it. So there is some advice for you on red um, watercolour paints and um, how they mix. And obviously all proceeds from this video in 12 months time. I will double out of my own pocket and submit to World AIDS Day. If that's not a charity you particularly want to support, well, to be honest, I think you're a terrible human being. So um, I don't really want you watching my videos if that's the kind of attitude you have. Um, this video is supporting World AIDS Day. End of story. So um, if you wanted to set up a split palette with split neutrals, split primaries, sorry, the, what obviously people do is cad red, alizarin crimson, or permanent alizarin crimson. That's a very common combination. I would tend to use permanent rose instead of alizarin crimson as my cool neutral. And I would probably, if I was to do it like now, my warm red would probably be... Still probably cad red. Still probably cadmium red, because... Even though it's a mineral pigment, doesn't granulate very much, it mixes stably, doesn't come out of mixes too much, it's not mucky and muddy, it tends to be very reliable. So I would use cadmium red and quinacridone rose or permanent rose as my um, warm and my cool respectively. And if I wanted an earth red, um, I would probably be using Venetian red right down here as my earth red if I needed one and if I wanted to do an entirely dye based palette if I was completely crazy and thought that was a good idea and I needed a warm dye based red it's a bit tricky I mean you can probably get away with pyrrole red not the deep version but yeah um, I wouldn't do that to be really honest it's just not not a road I want to go down particularly. So there are all of the red watercolours that I have. I mean, there are other reds. There are dozens of other reds made by other manufacturers. Many of these have got the same pigments in as other reds. Different manufacturers call things different things, which is why I always refer to in all my videos, I always refer to Windsor Red Deep as Pyrrole Red Deep, always. I always call Windsor Blue, Phthalo Blue. I always call, as I did just now, Windsor Green Yellow Shade, I call Phthalo Green Yellow Shade because at least then you will understand what I mean. So it's important to look at the pigments and it's important if you're trying to find a paint, don't go, oh, Permanent Rose, that'll be the same as this other brand's Permanent Rose. Look at the pigment and find one with the same pigment. So if you need some, if you find something that's got PR50 in it, look for something with PR50. Doesn't matter if the name of the colour is different as long as the only colour in it is PR50. Now that doesn't necessarily still mean you're going to get a perfect match because a lot of those iron reds, Venetian red, Caput Mortuum, Indian red and so on, have actually got the same pigment in all of them. 
it's the size of the grain of the mineral that they're using that gives them their very different colors and very different granulations. So if you do want to get a perfect match, do a bit more research, but if you want generally the same, match the pigment, never the name of the paint. Thank you all very much. Oh, there's a fly on my work. How rude. Thank you all very much and good evening.